All right, everybody, welcome back. We are uh, going to keep on with our series on kinematics in 2D. Um, and now we are talking about uh, kind of the big deal of kinematics in 2D, which is projectile motion. So we're going to define projectile motion as really anytime anything is flying through the air, anytime something is in free fall. And previously we saw one-dimensional projectiles, like just throwing a ball straight up in the air or maybe throwing it straight down off a cliff. And now we're going to look at what happens when we maybe throw the ball forwards and upwards, or maybe something that goes off a cliff but starts with a horizontal velocity. So you'll remember from our conversations that um, X and Y components are uh, perpendicular because they're X and Y, and therefore they are totally independent. Now, what that means in terms of vectors is that if you know the X velocity, that's great, but it has nothing to do with the Y velocity or the Y displacement or the Y acceleration and vice versa. Now, if you think back to our conversations, what we noticed about projectiles is the X components have no net force. Um, there's no net force working on the projectile in the X direction. And so what that means is the acceleration is always zero. If the acceleration is zero, then that means you're going at a constant velocity. So the only equation you can use in the x direction is this one, dx equals dx over t. No acceleration means constant velocity means life is really simple. However, in the y direction, things are a little more complicated. Because there's a constant acceleration of g, which is due to gravity, of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And so because there's... Um, that uh, constant acceleration in the downwards direction, we need to use the big three. And so if you thought you were done with all those fancy kinematics equations, well, sorry, but you're not. Now, you'll remember from the big three that we've got V, Y, V, Y naught, A, Y, D, Y, and T. And so we've got those five variables that, um, that we are gonna keep coming up whenever we look at something uh, that's accelerating. And now, I um, just want to remind you that these first four are all vectors. And so their direction is going to be super important. And because they're vectors, we can only talk about them in the y direction. However, the one value we can use on both sides is time. And that is because time is a scalar. So if you know how long it's traveling in the x direction, you also know how long it's traveling in the y direction and vice versa. So we're just going to do one example here just to kind of set this up. And there, we're going to have a particular way of setting these problems up. And um, I'm going to show you what I think is like the best system. And it, it works really, really well. So if you stick to this, it's really systematic. And, um, and it's going to get you to the right answer. It just might take a few steps. So a student is sitting on the roof of their house, which is 12 meters high. That's a pretty tall house. She can launch water balloons from a slingshot at 14 meters per second. That's a pretty good slingshot. Um, if she fires a water balloon directly horizontally, A, how long will it be airborne? And B, how far forward will it travel? Well, no big surprise for anyone who's been paying attention. The first thing we need to do is we need to draw a picture. So here is how all houses look in my world. There we go. We got a door. Perfect. And we have a not to scale student who is sitting on the house with some sort of slingshot device launching a water balloon that away. Because they launch it horizontally, we know what's going to happen. It's going to kind of go through the air, and then it's going to be like, it's going to hit the ground somewhere over here. Now, we know that that's going to be a parabolic path because it's accelerating in the y direction, but continuing at a constant velocity in the x direction. Um, I'm just going to add in a few things that I know here. Like, for example, this initial velocity is 14 meters per second. That's a little hard to see, but you know what 14 looks like. Um, and 12 meters high. So the launch point here is 12 meters above the ground. So we're looking for two things. How long will it be airborne? So that's really just asking for T. What is T? And how far forward it will travel? How far forward it travels, I guess, would be this right here. And you can think about what that would be. What variable would we call that? We'll talk about it in a second. Now, the way I want you to set these up is because our X and Y components are independent, then we're going to make a little chart here. Uh, X on one side, Y on the other. Probably need more space on the Y side because Y is just more complicated. Now, on the X side of things, we've only got the three variables we talked about. VX, DX, T. That's it. So the only things that ever show up on the X side. On the Y side, we've got VY, VY naught, AY, DY, and T. 
And this is a really important skill. So just stop for a second and appreciate that we now have like seven different variables because remember time is the same on both sides, but there's seven different variables. You have to go back to this question and peel through the layers here and figure out what variable is what. And setting it up is going to be really, really important. If you do that, the rest of it is just algebra. So let's take a look at here. We've got 14 meters per second. What does this 14 meters per second tell me? Well, I launched the balloon or they launched the balloon forwards in that forwards direction. So which velocity is that? Well, it turns out that if you're going horizontally, that is in the x direction. So that 14 meters per second is the x. And that's going to be 14 the whole time because the x doesn't change. Um, let's see what else we got here. So 12, 12 meters high. Okay, 12 meters high. Well, this is kind of telling me something about the y direction. So I've kind of got a hint that maybe this is, maybe this is dy. But what I have to stop and realize is the ball started up here and it fell down to this point right here. So I can't say dy is 12, but I can say that dy is negative 12 meters because that water balloon went down a total of 12 meters. And those are the only two numbers I was given. So um, there's no more I can really kind of pull out of here. I have to just reason it out from the situation. Well, the first thing to recognize is that um, since this house is probably on Earth and uh, we're ignoring air resistance, the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's something you always know. Um, the other thing that we know is maybe a little bit less obvious, but maybe you can think of what it is. We know one of these two y values in terms of the velocity. If you launch the balloon totally horizontally, it's going directly to the right, say, then it is not going up or down at all, which means the initial y velocity is actually zero. And so um, I went from only having two variables and I've got a whole mess of variables. And I can see here that as long as I have three on this side, then I can do something about the other two. Um, and so let's start with that. So how long will it be airborne? I'm going to choose, and I can choose either side. I can work on the x side or work on the y side. But uh, I know a lot more about the y side, so that's what I'm going to stick with. So how would I find time given these variables? Well, I could use D equals V naught T plus one half AT squared. And kind of nice because the initial Y velocity is zero. So I'm just going to check that out right away. And then I'm going to say D equals one half AT squared. And then I'm just going to do some algebra. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because we're getting pretty comfortable with this at this point. I'm going to multiply both sides by two. And so I get 2D equals AT squared. I'm going to divide both sides by A. And then finally, I got 2D over A equals T squared. My last step is I'm going to take the square root of everything. And I get T equals the square root of 2D over A. And I'm kind of running out of space. Maybe you are too. But we can just squeeze in here. 2 times negative 12 divided by negative 9.8. Now, that's actually kind of important right there. You can see that this negative 12, if I had forgotten that displacement was negative, and then I tried to divide by a negative, my whole radicand, everything aside this radical here, would be a negative, and then my computer or my calculator would tell me that I have broken math, and it would not be happy. So those two are going to cancel each other out, and we can calculate the answer. Knowing that these two ca cancel each other out, I might just do that ahead of time before I even put it in my calculator, just to save me the stress. Uh, 2 times 12 divided by 9.8, and that equals 1.5649, 1.5649, which I guess I would round off to two sig figs, so let's call that about 1.6 seconds. Now, um, some of you might, that are paying close attention, might be like, wait a second, you took the square root. Whenever you take the square root, the answer is plus or minus. Fair enough. The answer is plus or minus, but I could throw away the answer which says minus time and just reject that because um, that doesn't really make sense in this context. Now, I've got the time that the ball is in the air. That's great. Uh, but now I need to find this value right here. And maybe you've been thinking about that, percolating on that. What would we call that variable? What is that thing we're looking for? And I can hear you over the internet shouting it out. Of course, silly, that is dx. How far did it displace itself in the x? direction. So how I want to find this. And the good news is, is I know the time. So I can actually take this value and bring it over here and use it for my time calculation. Remember, that's the one variable that can go on either side. And I'm going to remember to use the extra digits when I do this calculation. 
So I remember that I've got dx equals to dx over t. And solving for dx, I get dx times t, which when I plug my values, oh, a little bit of equation on space, 14.0 uh, times 1.5649. I'm just going to use the number that's still in my calculator. If I'm being totally honest, I just multiply this number times 14, and I get an answer of 21.9089, blah, 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 blah. Let's call it 22. Excellent. Okay. So just a reminder, a quick recap of how we're going to approach these problems. First thing, obviously, draw a picture as good as this one or better. And then second step uh, is kind of new where we're going to set up X and Y variables separately. Write down all the possible variables. There's going to be eight things you're going to be looking for. And then plug in what you know and then basically um, see if you can find an equation that will help you solve. Okay. We're going to do more facts on this in class. So um, I guess that's it for now. Take care.